Welcome to another episode of Overlanding with Bruce. In this episode, we will be visiting ZBC in Gweru and then heading to the Gweru Military Museum before heading to Chinoy Caves and Chitaki Springs. And yes, we're going to be towing a caravan, which is also known as my wife's vanity case. We left early afternoon as we had to get to Gweru by 8 a.m. the next morning. Unfortunately, we couldn't leave earlier due to my wife's work commitments, so we're going to have to break some rules, and the main one being traveling at night. We arrived in Gweru early the next morning, where I had to be at ZBC Central Radio for a radio interview with Shepard. And it's finally here where we get to do some uh, overlanding with Bruce. He gets to talk about uh, his journeys in Zimbabwe and how he has seen Zimbabwe so far. And remember, this uh, special program is brought to us by the Zimbabwe Tourism Authority. They say, that let's get to jump on and just partner uh, this uh, program as we get to talk about tourism also in Zimbabwe and also chasing smiles uh, over Raleigh. Uh, Bruce, good morning and welcome to Central Radio. Good morning, I'm so sorry I'm late, but uh, <laughs> I got stuck in roadworks and all sorts of things, but thank you so much for having me, I'm so pleased to be here. As they say, better late than never. Exactly. Linda from Zimbabwe Tourism and Shepherd took us to the Gweru Military Museum after the interview, which was a really nice surprise. This is uh, the Zimbabwe Military Museum. It is the head office of the Central Region of National Museums and Monuments of Zimbabwe. National Museums is divided into five regions. So us as Central Region, our major focus is the military history of the country. As the military museum, we collect uh, military paraphernalia, basically the guns, the, 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 the uniforms and their batons, uh, the medals, we, we have the maps, military maps. Of course, you may not see some of these things, uh, but you are going to see major stuff which relate to the military history of the country. Basically, we are looking at the military history gallery and the police gallery. The museum is made up of several displays showing previous uniforms and weapons. Then there are various vehicles, both army and police outside, with a few aircraft a few hundred meters up the road in a large hangar. I was unfortunately not allowed to film a lot in the displays inside, but I was allowed to film the displays outside. Now you may remember these Vickers Vis guns from a previous video of mine. Here is what they used to look like when they were in service in the early 80s. This one first flew on the 28th of March 1956, with this last flight being on the 31st of May 1985. So this one retired earlier than those ones in Chugutu. This one started its life out on the 20th of July 1956, where it used to fly from the then Jan Smuts Airport in Johannesburg, South Africa to Heathrow Airport in London, England. It's pretty cramped inside and I couldn't imagine flying to London in it, especially when you're my size. There are quite a few different military aircraft on display in the main hangar inside. While wandering around these old aircraft, I could not help but wonder about their history, where they had flown, who had flown them, and how much work and effort it must have been to maintain them. This Canberra B2, when it was delivered in 1959, must have been a massively advanced aircraft of its time. Now this strange little aircraft was designed by French radio engineer Henri Mignot. It was a result of his ambition to design a safe aeroplane that could be built quickly and cheaply by any amateur familiar with simple woodwork and metalwork skills. 
It had a top speed of 100 kilometers an hour, believe it or not. Not really safe if you ask me. It's amazing how technology has moved on, hey? <laughs> While wandering around and looking at all this equipment and aircraft, I actually find it a little bit sad in a way. This is probably one of the most famous aircraft ever built, a Supermarine Spitfire. It's been on display in Guerrero Military Museum since 1993. PK-355 was built at the Castle Bromwich factory in Birmingham, England and delivered to the then Southern Rhodesian Air Force with serial number 65 on the 28th of March 1951. It transferred to the Royal Rhodesian Air Force at the time in October 1954. After its active service, PK-355 was initially displayed at the Bulawayo Museum from June 1955 to 1957, then went on to be displayed, mounted on a plinth, at Thornall Air Base between 1960 and 1981. I just want to give a massive thank you to Shepard from ZBC, Linda from Zimbabwe Tourism, and Mr. Gutu from Central Regions Museums for the absolutely fascinating trip through the military history of Zimbabwe. If you're ever in Gweru, make sure to stop by and pay them a visit. It was time to head to Chinoy, which was around 280 kilometers from Gweru. Looks like the area around the old Viscounts in Chugutu has been cleaned up since last passing through here. And there's a few traders, so hopefully there's people stopping to have a look at these old aircraft. Trying to find some accommodation in Chinoy and receiving, to be frank, some crazy quotes for very basic accommodation in the area that were actually even more expensive than staying in places like Leopard Rock Hotel, for example, we decided to risk it and stay at Chinoy Caves campsite against all recommendations on the internet. Shortly after setting up camp, we had a visitor. Munya, who had seen the landy and watches the channel, came to say hi. Munya has dreams of working in tourism one day and has grown up in a family who work in tourism. Great to meet you, Munya, and thank you for coming to say hi. The next morning we were awake early, excited to see the Chinoy Caves and excited to head down, down to the Zambezi Valley. got the opportunity to hand out some soccer balls in the morning traffic. Now this campsite is right next to the A1 which is the main road that heads from Harare to Zambia. The campsite does however stretch back a good kilometer away from the main road. The trucks were a bit noisy but it grew quiet from about 6 30 p.m. Speaking of facilities the bathrooms were absolutely spotless and had obviously recently been renovated. The water was hot, so the shower was good too. Day visitors also used different facilities to the overnight guests. Now bear in mind, this was fairly early in the morning and we saw staff cleaning up the areas where day visitors had bribed the day before. Certainly a very well kept facility. We also met Anchin and Burnt who had been traveling through Zambia on their adventure bikes. Before heading to Mana Pools, we decided to go and see the Chinoy Caves. I had seen them many years ago when I was a kid, so it was a nice walk down memory lane. Hopefully you can see me, we're in the Chinoy Caves, 
and a bit of a story to get in here because uh, there's no change at the entrance so I'm not sure how everyone's paying and getting their change. So if you're camping here, it's uh, $10 a night per person and then you pay $3 to get into the cave. Um, but there's no change, so try and come with small denomination notes. The bird life is surprising and almost deafening and the water in the sleeping pool is crystal clear and there's even fish in it, can you believe that? Surrounded by a national park, the Chinoy Caves are a national monument. The caves consist of a system of tunnels and caverns and are composed of limestone and dolomite. The descent to the main cave with its pool of, of cobalt blue water is spectacular. The Chinoy Cave system is regarded as a dying one in geological time spans because they are slowly collapsing. Legend has it that a visitor cannot successfully throw a stone across the pool as the sacred spirits who watch over the pool will catch it and bestow a curse upon the person who threw it. I'm not taking any chances. The cave is also known to the locals as Chiro Rodziwa, which means Pool of the Fallen. It is believed that by local communities that the caves were used as a refuge by a bandit called Nyamakokwera, who murdered many victims by throwing them into the silent pool. He was eventually defeated and killed by Chinoy, who became the local Mashona chief. To explore both sections, you need to be fairly fit because there's a lot of climbing of stairs, so you'll certainly get your steps in. Also, wear some decent shoes and carry a torch. As you'll see, I made the mistake of not doing either. I can't actually see where I'm going. There's no lights in here. There are a few lights, but not enough to get to all channels of this cave. And I should have brought a torch, so if you come, bring a torch. Okay, so don't be like Bruce and wear slops on this little adventure. Wear some decent walking shoes. It's funny, some of your steps actually sound hollow. So I'm not sure if there's caves under where we're walking, but it sounds like there is. And it's quite a steep climb out here. We left Chinoy Recreational Park, happy that we had decided to stay there. I think it's also perfectly positioned for an overnight stop if you're camping before heading for the Zambezi Valley or Kariba. We will definitely be back on future trips. From there, it's a short 175 kilometer trip to the Mukuti turnoff to Kariba, where we also filled up with fuel before heading to Morongoro to check in. And then it's a short seven kilometer drive down the escarpment into the Zambezi Valley, where you turn off the main road and hit the dirt. Please be careful on this entire A1 route as it's narrow with many potholes and many trucks. From the main gate to Nyakasagana gate is only about 30 kilometers. You then sign in again and you turn right towards Chitaki Springs. It's so great to be in the Zambezi Valley again. I was a little worried about towing the caravan through to Chitaki, but was very surprised at how much the tracks have been opened up since I was here a year ago. Clearly more people had been visiting the area.
This is quite amazing how things have changed. Here is what it looked like almost exactly a year ago at this exact spot. I've read a lot of complaints from people saying they didn't see many animals in the area. Well, that's to be expected, I think. There's a super pride of, I think it was 22 lions, that keep all the animals on their toes. So they tend to disappear fairly quickly when anything strange appears in the area. Our home for the next two nights came into view. Just wait until you see this campsite. Welcome to Camp Baobab at Chitaki Springs. It would be very hard for me to choose between this campsite or a campsite next to the river. Both have their good points, both are spectacular. One massive advantage of having a caravan like this is that it's so easy to set up so you don't waste too much time building camp before you can light the fire, sit and relax. I've seen some spectacular sunsets in my travels, but it's hard to beat this one. Let me show you how the colors change during sunset in the Zambezi Valley. It's really strange in the bush. There's a short period where it grows absolutely silent without anything making a noise. This happens just after the sun disappears below the horizon. And then this happens. So close. Being on high alert with all these lions around, we heard some noises in the bushes nearby us. Thankfully, it was only an elephant. But as I was shining the torch, something caught the cord of my eye. It was a female lion that had run between two bushes barely 30 meters away from us. We headed into the caravan and turned on all the lights only to see another female about 80 meters behind the caravan. After turning on the lights they turned around and headed back down the road and disappeared into the darkness. I've been told in the past that the best defense for lions at night is a really bright torch. It seemed to have worked this time. I don't know what their intentions were but I'm glad I noticed them. The next morning we were awake early, just before the sun appeared on the horizon to the chorus of birds and the barks of baboons in the distance. The moon was still high in the sky and the baobabs glowed red with the rising sun. I don't think it could get any more spectacular than this.
decided to go for a drive to the springs to see if we could see the lions that had made so much noise last night. Unfortunately, they were hidden away somewhere, probably lying with their bellies full and tired after last night's shenanigans. The Chitaki River is fed by a spring and both were very dry at the time we were. With not much to see, we headed back to camp and just decided to laze around the campsite for the day. Late in the afternoon, a troop of baboons came and set up camp in the baobabs above us. Apart from a few noisy children that were sorted out very quickly by the adults, they were fairly quiet as soon as the sun went down. Then on cue, as the sun dipped below the horizon, the lion started. In all honesty, I was a little sad to have only spent two nights here but I was looking forward to the next part of our journey which would see us heading towards Chawori, an area I had never been before. So the next morning, after coffee, we packed up, buried the ashes and headed for Chawori. A drive like this is always like a game drive through a national park, so it's less boring than sitting on an open highway. That way you're also not rushing from point A to point B the whole time, which you often see in Botswana during the busier months. After a short drive from the campsite, we were back on the main track towards Chawori. We were still a little unsure whether we would make it all the way because we had mixed reports about bridges being washed out during recent rains. Time will tell if we will make it. We find ourselves in an amazing campsite with some really thoughtful items included in the campsite that you never see anywhere in Southern Africa. Cannon also takes us up the river fishing. Along the way we see some elephants take a swim to an island and we see lots of hippos. I also warned Cannon that I'm not a very good fisherman and that he would need to show me exactly how to do this thing. See how tiny these hooks are. Oh, these sure. are the ones which we used to catch, catch the bait. The bait yeah. oh, What's okay. the chest of fish here for Finally, I catch a tiger fish and feel very proud of myself until this happens. I would also like to thank everybody for your support. We've recently hit 10,000 subscribers and I'm actually just blown away. I don't even know what to say anymore. So thank you so much for your support and thank you for watching.